care ethics is a more recent form of ethics that was inspired by uh, the feminist movement and philosophy. I'm going to look at Ava Kate's uh, specific account of care ethics here in her recent book, Learning from My Daughter, The Value and Care of Disabled Minds. I think this is a really interesting account of care ethics because it really proceeds from her intimate experience with her own uh, disabled daughter and the way in which she has uh, um, grown both uh, with her daughter and um, philosophically speaking. And I think she's able to provide really uh, a really rich account of care, um, which is why I wanted to use this text as the uh, foundation for this video on care ethics. Um, so, we can ask the question that Kite asks, is care an important concept for philosophy? Because it is no doubt, you know, that it's required that care ethics comes from the philosophical tradition. And yet, it's a certain rejection of the philosophical tradition as well, right? So it's a certain ethics that, um, as Kite explains, it emerges from the philosophical horizon, right? It's almost at, like its limit. It's still influenced by it, still a part of it, and yet it's uh, at its limit. So why is care ethics something recent, right? Which is why she asks, is care an important concept for philosophy? She mentions the case of where in Plato's dialogues, uh, Aristotle, like in the Theaetetus, for example, likens himself to a philosophical midwife, right? Where he seems to uh, almost embody the kind of care a mother would go uh, give for her children, um, but for ideas, and then specifically, right, uh, a midwife where you would facilitate uh, the giving of birth by an, uh, another woman. In this case, right, Socrates is doing this with ideas. So there's a kind of care and nurturing that takes place uh, in that process where it's very intimate for, you know, the person you're dealing with. But by and large, care hasn't been something uh, that's been paid much uh, attention to in the Western philosophical tradition. And yet, right, there are kind of little uh, nuggets like with the Socrates example we can pull out and so this is almost an attempt to say like you know there are these little cases where we find almost an acknowledgement of the um, intimate relation of care and how valuable it is but it's almost just overlooked almost uh, given that care is just something um, you know given in, in a society that doesn't require you know further scrutiny and further elaboration for that uh, matter. So, care ethics emerges uh, with a feminist background. So, there's a way in which the term care is denaturalized. So, care ethicists want to take the term care, caring, right? And they, they want to denaturalize it. So, they don't want to say, well, only mothers or only women uh, can actually care for someone else, even though this is where we can look to find, you know, empirically uh, rich accounts of care that we can learn from about how to be um, better persons towards others that need to be cared for. And in that case, right, there's also then a de-gendering of care because it's not the case that only women could ever care or only mothers uh, can ever care. We can look at the uh, role that women and specifically mothers, you know, play in child rearing and things like that. And we can abstract from that, right, a more uh, abstract account of care that then can be applied in particular situations by various human beings that is not only, you know, uh, for women. In light of this, there's also a public-private, uh, a criticism of the public-private distinction by feminists, where typically you find in, uh, like, political philosophy, right, the private domain of, like, the household, for example, justice really isn't talked about in the private sphere, that's supposed to be the public sphere, and then maybe morality, right, is included more in the private sphere, both both the public spheres as well, but you don't really have that much of an interrogation of, like, the role of uh, a husband and wife and the kind of relation they should have uh, with one another in traditional um, uh, uh, philosophies like utilitarianism or deontology, um, for example. So, uh, intimately linked to care ethics is this 
a feminist critique of certain roles um, and certain ideas, right, that we take for granted, and actually looking at, you know, well, what are the, 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 the foundations of these things, and are they necessary? We find, I think, a really good account of this uh, critique that is given by care ethics from Virginia Held. So Virginia Held says that the ethics of care rejects the view of the dominant moral theories that the more abstract the reasoning about a moral problem, the better because the more likely to avoid bias and arbit arbitrariness, the more nearly to achieve impartiality. The ethics of care respects rather than removes itself from the claims of particular others with whom we share actual relationships. So something about then in this process of um, you know, this feminist critique of which the uh, care ethics emerges from is this criticism of this idea that an ethics must be general, it must be impartial, and instead, care ethics wants to embrace the actual relationships we have with one another and says, what is the right uh, disposition I should have towards these relationships? Instead of just rejecting them and saying, well, we need to apply them to, you know, the same formula we apply to everything else to see whether or not, you know, it produces enough utility uh, or anything like that. So, of course, we'll uh, get into more of that later. But we can begin by understanding care as both something descriptive, but also normative, right? So, we can have a descriptive account of care, how care actually takes place, what is required for care, and then we can have a normative account of care, which wants to say how we ought to care. So, it is, uh, you know, clear that care is always embedded in a practice of caring. So, you have examples of like mothering, nursing, elder care, or assistance for a disabled person, right? So in the case of mothering, you have a practice of actually raising a child, uh, making sure they have food, trying to make sure they have the best education, teaching them about how to navigate in the world, right? These are certain practices that one who takes on the role of mothering or even fathering, um, you know, they engage in certain, uh, sometimes routines, other times uh, 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 things they maybe picked up on that help facilitate whatever it is the goal of the person you're caring for. Nursing, right? If someone's sick, a nurse is going to care for the sick patient and they're going to do so according to a certain practice, maybe taking the Hippocratic Oath or other things like that. Kitei says that, and practices are themselves a source of normativity. Practices provide the context by which we make claims of truth or falsity and within which we practice virtues. A practice that is the set of activities with structures, rules, values, and virtues has an aim. It has a certain telos, right? An end which it wants to complete by which we evaluate behavior as good within that practice. So we have both, right? We can look at a, a descriptive account of um, caring as a nurse, for example, and we can see the kind of rules that uh, you know, a nurse is going to play by, so to speak. And we can determine whether or not um, they provided care the way they ought to have provided care, right? So normatively, by looking at the goal the practice is supposed to achieve, the health of the patient, for example. So caring practices share an ideal to meet the genuine needs and wants of an individual, right? It's always for the sake of that other person. And if they don't get that, right, there would be real harm. So Kate says more positively, Caring practices tend to people's cares, in all capital letters, cares, right, are to those things that people care about, which figure in their flourishing, and which they cannot accomplish without the proper assistance. So, for example, uh, if we want to take the case of a student, okay, the kind of cares, in capital letters, the kind of cares a student might have is getting a good grade so they can graduate, get their degree, and then uh, successfully pursue the career they want. So a teacher, in caring for the student, helps facilitate right, the flourishing of that student by achieving those ends, if they are the ends the student wants. So you have both this account of, again, right, the practices, it always takes place, caring takes place within a practice, and yet there is a certain normativity about these practices where we can judge what I should do in t uh, carrying out that practice, right, what the aim is, and whether or not that practice was successful. 
So certain features of an ethics of care are threefold, labor, attitude, and virtue. So labor is required for an ethics of care because caregiving that attends to the needs of, it's, it's caregiving that attends to the needs of another, where you put aside your own needs for someone else more vulnerable, right? Someone who can't, so to speak, um, enable their own flourishing, right? Pursue what they exactly want to pursue. And often, right, you in caring for the other person by undertaking this labor, become intimate with the body and bodily functions of the cared for. So sometimes like, let's say, you know, my cat is sick and I have to take care of my cat. I need to become very uh, aware of her bodily functions to read them to see what is it that I can do are there certain signs that let me know medication isn't working or maybe she's getting better or she wants you know something that is going to help facilitate right and all of that requires labor it requires time time is a very important thing right because you you need to see like for example if I have to check the breathing rate of my cat the labor required for, you know, giving medicine and things like that. Or let's say for, uh, again, going back to being a teacher and, and caring for students, it requires labor on my part to find out, well, you know, what is the state that my students are in? What level are they at, so to speak? So I know how to tailor maybe my lectures and what I say to them to best facilitate their own uh, flourishing. And that way I become... Um, more intimate, so to speak, with you know uh, the, um, the actual body of my students by understanding what their needs are. Attitude, right? This is a, a certain open responsiveness to another, working to understand what another person requires. So I'm not going to be a very good teacher if I don't really care what it is my students need, right? I need to maybe recognize are my students more like working class and they have other jobs they have to attend to as well? Or is this more like if an Ivy League school where their parents pay for everything and they have more time so maybe I can actually uh, orient work in a certain way that best uh, fills their time and then otherwise doesn't burden someone else's time if they also have like a job they have to work uh, more frequently. Or let's take another example about attitude. Um, we could say that of uh, elder care, right? Sometimes maybe if I'm treating a patient with dementia, I might need to be patient and understand maybe sometimes when the dementia patient doesn't really understand what's going on and maybe they are um, being combative or, or constantly asking questions, not understanding you know, uh, where they are and, and, and the kind of help they need. For someone really to care for them, they need to have a certain attitude that is open to uh, being aware of what is it that would take for this person to flourish, right? And it's not just simply what I want to get out of this, it's about what they need, right? So being open about, you know, trying to take in all the information I can to find out what is it that they need. And finally, right, care requires virtue, a certain disposition to care about, in all capital, let all capital letters, care itself, right? I have to to, to be a caring person, I have to care about caring. It sounds ridiculous, but it's about cultivating a certain disposition to um, reach out to others that might need care and learning how to act in ways that help uh, uh, further the ends of that person so that they can flourish. One is probably not going to be a very good care if they don't actually care about caring, right? And this is where we have this interesting... Uh, almost uh, kind of tightrope that is walked in care ethics where on the one hand, right, we're talking about virtues, reminiscent of virtue ethics. We talk about caring about caring for the sake of caring, a little bit similar to deontology, and yet we also judge what we do based on the outcome, whether or not we actually did care for them such that um, uh, they were best able to flourish, right, reminiscent of a kind of uh, uh, consequentialism. So, these three things taken together are required to actually, in all capital letters, care. So, an ethics of care begins with embodied self. So, it begins with the way in which we actually exist and move around uh, and make a life in this world. Because how we are embodied, our, our state of mind, our actual physical bodies themselves, uh, maybe the material sources we have at hand, 
all of these things um, in one way or another affect what we do in life and how and to what extent we can flourish. So we need to understand about this uh, 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 primacy of the embodied self and how we then are connected uh, to other embodied selves. So uh, Eva Kate says that while in dominant ethical theories like utilitarianism, deontology, virtue ethics, the self is a self-determining adult who is an independent agent and party to an ethical determination, an ethics of care does not presume that all parties in an ethical exchange are adults capable of self-determination or independence, right? And this is where we can see the influence of, for example, her taking care of her disabled uh, daughter. Because there's this uh, certain influence in like utilitarian and, and deontological ethics of a kind of liberal individualism where it's all assumed we are, um, you know, autonomous, uh, isolated individuals that proceed first from ourselves. Instead, care ethics wants to begin from ourselves as being relational, right? We want to understand ourselves as being relational selves. That not only then are we capable of having our own desires, but we are selves that are capable of being motivated by the cares of the other. And that what actually makes possible not only me care, being motivated by the cares of others, is that what makes possible me being interested in my own ends I actually require the care of others. I cannot get the education I want without the care from other teachers and friends and fellow students or my parents and so on. A whole structure, a whole network, which facilitates then me flourishing. So care ethics does not then begin from this idea of, of the self rationally understanding everything they want and trying to work out you know deals where uh, both people benefit um, you know, selfishly, uh, then it's supposed to work out for everyone in the end. Instead, care ethics begins from, uh, uh, you know, it, interrelationally. This does not mean care ethics is about self-sacrifice. So, Kate says, an ethics of care ought to preserve the caregiver's ability not to stray from her own moral compass in her willingness to become, so to speak, engrossed in the other. So it's not the case in that care ethics advocates a kind of uh, self-sacrificing of one for the sake of another person who needs to be cared for. Now, to some extent, you sacrifice yourself, but it's really not a, it would be wrong to think of it as sacrificing because that would then begin from a place of viewing ourselves as necessarily uh, not connected to one another. But instead, if we see ourselves as connected, then by caring for another one else, I end up caring for the very foundation, right, in, we could say, as a society that makes possible my own flourishing as well. And this doesn't mean, crucially, that sometimes to care for another person, we should just give up, you know, our own morals for the sake of the other person. Again, there's this kind of tightrope that one has to walk to, you know, to what extent maybe do I have to go and uh, care for another person, uh, but that doesn't put me, you know, from my own uh, um, moral compass, right, uh, violating certain things I want to live by in, in, in so doing. Moral deliberation and care ethics is not something um, straightforward like one might associate with uh, say utilitarianism, right? Where you just, you know, you weigh almost like a scale. Okay, what's the outcome? Is it uh, a greater happiness or pain? You know, and you just figure it out that way. What care ethics wants to do is actually take into account our emotions, right? And this is necessarily going to uh, muddy things. It's going to make it um, less clear because care ethics wants to actually look at, you know, how do we actually live as individuals? It doesn't want to... Uh, try to manufacture this fake kind of vacuum where everything is like ones and zeros and we can cleanly and neatly right articulate everything as it exists and therefore everything that we ought to do. Care ethicists find emotions to be a rich epistemic source for moral deliberation. So things like love, empathetic concern, commitment, loyalty, compassion, and so on. All these things we as individuals right in our own particular situations we have to take these things into account and we do so by thinking okay 
how loyal am I to this person? So to what extent maybe should I care for this uh, person? Do I find myself having a lot of compassion for someone else? Or maybe I should help you know, facilitate their own ends a bit more, maybe less. Maybe uh, I don't really love someone else and so it would be best if I try to let someone else care for that person as opposed you know, to me spending my limited time caring for that person. Right? Maybe I need to find one of their own friends to take care of them if they're wanting to completely rely on me and I don't really care so much about them, right? So what's fascinating about care ethics, again, right? It wants to begin from the, the real rough ground of, of human existence. But what that means is that the scope of moral judgments is partial and contextual. It's always uh, comes down to our actual relationships we have as opposed to, um, you know, abstracted relationships that have to be generalized where, you know, uh, I, I shouldn't save my friend over someone else in a burning building if saving the other person over my friend would create more utility, right? Care ethics wants to actually acknowledge the relationships we have and accept, yes, I'm probably going to have more love and compassion and loyalty and so on to save my friend from the burning building as opposed to the complete stranger. So what's also, um, I think, an additive to this theory about that is it not only acknowledges this, but it says in the actual relationships we have, we have privileged epistemic access to those particular others. So we are more often actually be, uh, better able to understand what they would need to flourish because of our relationships. So Kate says, the limitations of our ability to form significant emotional engagements beyond a rather narrow sphere, as well as the demanding nature of care, means that a capital letters care-based ethics is inevitably sensitive to proximity whether it be to the relational proximity of family, <clears throat> excuse me, to family or friends, or the geographical contiguity of neighbors and fellow citizens, right? And as, you know, um, uh, Bernard Williams said, right, uh, there can be one thought too many, right? Sometimes certain ethical theories like deontology or utilitarianism might make us think, you know, a little bit too much, have one thought too many about, well, should I really save my friend? Should I actually save the other person? Such that those ethical theories, right, according to care ethicists, those ethical theories would end up nullifying friendships where it wouldn't even make sense why you'd be friends if you wouldn't be willing to uh, go out of your way to save them, maybe over someone else. Now, what this means is that because of the impossibility for care ethics, of impartiality uh, because of the impossibility of properly adjudicating moral obligations and responsibilities because that's not given definite or universal we might not get the clear answers that we would like and this is why again moral deliberation uh, uh, is not something clear and given it requires hard work it's not guaranteed in care ethics To care, right, all capital letters, to care for another is to care for another for their own sake, as I said before. So what do we mean by flourishing? An individual can flourish if they have everything which enables them to fulfill their desires. So when we care for someone else and when we allow them to flourish, we don't do so because of some larger abstract conception of goodness like, um, you know, the categorical imperative uh, says we ought to do this or that uh, this is just going to create better overall utility. And we don't do it for the sake of the community, that it's just a good for the community. We do it for the sake of that person. So more relations for care ethics are always particular. They're directed at another person. But when we do this, if we want to care for them, to have them flourish, two things are required. One, a person flourishes when the person has or has access to or can strive to attain 
either on her own or assisted by another, the things an individual truly cares about, in the sense that these are the things that make it worthwhile for a person to get up every morning. So, I might flourish when I am able to teach and make enough money uh, to uh, put together a, a lecture for someone else, or to buy the books, right, where I can research a topic and write about it, such that I want to get up every morning, because that's what makes my life meaningful. Someone else, probably many people, that's not why you would get up every morning to do that, right? Some people love to get up every morning, you know, and rise and grind, so to speak, right? Have a nine to five job or something like that. So ensuring they get the resources they need, right? Their, their housing paid for, they have a car to drive to the work and to do that, that might help that individual flourish because that's why, you know, that's what makes their life meaningful. But most people maybe might not want just a simple nine to five job. Maybe they want something a little bit different. So each thing, right? Flourishing is subjective. It's unique to that individual. The second thing that flourishing requires is the things the individual truly cares about that are genuine needs are met. That is, needs which if they fail to be met will result in a genuine harm to the individual. And legitimate wants are satisfied. That is, wants that can be met without sacrificing the equally legitimate wants of another. So we have the first requirement, right? That a, a person, uh, when they get these things they truly care about, it continues them, right, to, to enable to uh, wake up every morning and carry out uh, their desires and live a happy life, a, a, a meaningful life really is what we should say. And that if they did not get those things in some way, psychologically or physically, this, you know, we could be talking about uh, a disabled person that needs a certain care that otherwise if they didn't get it, their body would deteriorate. Or we could literally talk about certain things like um, if someone working a job, they really love the job, but if they don't make enough money to pay for let's say, um, uh, you know, a gas and to pay uh, the car payments. They couldn't get to the job, and so, you know, they might not get enough money to even have a roof over their head, right? Um, if they don't get that, then they are not flourishing because serious harm would occur. So it's incumbent on others who have the means to help them to give them that help, to care for them, to enable their flourishing. But what this does not mean is then you take from someone else, right? So I should not help my friend and their needs and desires that make, you know, their life meaningful for them. I shouldn't take from someone else to help my friend, you know? It shouldn't be uh, for the, uh, we shouldn't basically take advantage of someone else for the sake of someone else we love. Because then we would be, be denying the other person the ability to flourish, um, which is why caring is a virtue. I have to care about caring such that I don't only care about my friend because they're my friend. I care about caring for its own sake. And if I steal from someone else to benefit my friend so my friend can flourish, I diminish the ability of someone else to flourish. Now, maybe sometimes if you can take from them and it actually doesn't affect them, that might be okay. Because it might be the case that that other person has a moral obligation to maybe they have a hundred billion dollars, right? And other people are starving. They might have a moral obligation to give up some of their money to help the needs of others because giving up that money doesn't affect uh, their own ability to flourish. And yet, by giving that money to the other people, their needs would be met such that they can also flourish, right? So there are some cases where... Um, it might be okay to sacrifice um, the needs of another person as long as it does not sacrifice right, their legitimate needs such that if they did not have those, they themselves would not be able to flourish. So again, that's why it's, care ethics is not simply uh, self-sacrificial. So further about what it means to morally harm someone else and them uh, not receiving the care they need. So Kate writes that in an ethics of care, moral harm results when important genuine needs and legitimate wants, especially of vulnerable persons, go unmet. When our concerns elicit only indifference, 
when vulnerability arouses disdain and abuse rather than care, and most especially, when human connections are broken through exploitation, domination, hurt, neglect, detachment, or abandonment. So one example of this where we can see where real moral harm results is when, for example, um, maybe uh, people go bankrupt because of medical debt. So when someone needs serious you know, medical care uh, through no fault of their own, right? maybe they have cancer, and they either can't get the treatment because they can't afford it, even though the treatment is available for them, right? The society has the means to give that individual uh, care. Or they end up going bankrupt and their livelihood is seriously affected by receiving that care. Moral harm results. And the reason is because there would be the ability for them to receive the care and yet either they inadequately received it in the case of uh, the medical bankruptcy or if they just can't afford it, they don't receive the care at all. So there's a certain obligation sometimes on other individuals or maybe even society to ensure right, that care uh, is given where, when it's not given, moral harm or even physical harm results. So there are some critiques uh, of an ethic of care that uh, Kite addresses. So we'll go through each of these five critiques here. One is the critique that an ethics of care really advocates a certain indifference to distant others, right? That if it wants to focus on contextual relationships and, and, and uh, the partiality we have to another person, right? Like my friend over a stranger, that care ethics might seem to advocate a certain indifference to, say, people living in another country. Well, as I've already uh, kind of spoken about, that's not entirely the case because a, a person who truly cares would develop the virtue of caring such that they care about caring for its own sake. That when someone else needs uh, 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 care, that they want that other person to receive care. So there's a certain privileging, but there's not an indifference to others. So there's a privileging of those closest to us, but there's not an indifference or even a rejection of the caring required by distant others. Another critique is temptations of unsolicited acts of kindness. That it might seem like care ethics is advocating people to always go at go out of their way to just some stranger. Oh, let me open this door for you. Oh, uh, let me you know um, uh, carry this thing for you because you look like you can't carry it. Uh, care ethics does not advocate that because a lot of times we know um, you can make someone feel inferior if you just. Uh, always want to care for them such that, you know, it makes them feel like they can't do anything for themselves. This is why care ethics focuses on par partiality, because when you uh, know the people, you know, you're, you're, you're caring for, you best know what they need. So you know, hey, I don't need to help this person in this situation. They can do it themselves, right? And in this way, you keep them uh, feeling as like uh, uh, autonomous uh, as possible, while you can still be a, a morally good person. Now, again, right, the cult of self-sacrifice and the collapse of relationality. Um, care ethics doesn't uh, say you should just sacrifice yourself to others, especially because if you end up doing that, you might not be able to uh, care for other people because if you sacrifice yourself for caring for others, well, who's going to care for you? You know, if you don't allow your own needs to be taken care of, you can't take care of the needs of others. So there isn't a complete uh, self-sacrifice advocated by care ethics. Now, the care ethics as a slave morality is what comes from uh, Nietzsche. So uh, Nietzsche thought that certain ethics like deontology and utilitarianism or Christian ethics advocate, advocated a kind of slave morality uh, which sought to stop people from pursuing their own individual uh, uh, greatness, and instead, again, you know, uh, uh, try to improve, you know, the weak, make to make everyone really kind of weak, uh, and embrace weakness. Uh, care ethics doesn't do that. In fact, care ethics, uh, according to Kate, wants to facilitate care for people that need care, such that they actually can be stronger and they can pursue their own desires, right, of what they find to be great. So that would be the the response to the. Right, the criticism that care ethics is a slave morality. And finally, right, the critique that 
care ethics promotes unequal relationships. Um, care ethics, you know, doesn't entirely reject this because there are sometimes certain unequal relationships like, you know, a, a parent to a child, but there is a rejection of, for example, paternalism, right? Care ethics does not advocate one person, um, uh, you know, being in a position of, of more authority and more power when they take care of someone else, because you remember to truly care for someone else, you have to meet the desires of what the other person wants. So if you are doing things the other person doesn't want, which could be the case in an unequal relationship, where one person has more power over another, uh, there might be coercion involved in that situation. And you would be coercing uh, uh, someone else to do something they don't want. But care ethics does not advocate that. That would not be a case of genuine caring.